want to welcome you again to our services for Carmichael Baptist Church. It's so good to be with you as always. We're continuing our study on the epistles of Christ to his churches in the book of Revelation. This isn't just a historical study about these seven churches that were there thousands of years ago. It's about what's going on in our churches. We need to hear what the Lord says to his churches. We need to apply these things. And I want you to think, as we get into this lesson today, what makes this, this a, a successful church? What are we aiming for? Now, I would hope that that's in your mind, whether you're a pastor or a member of a church or a deacon, whoever you are, we are working towards something, just like you would in any business, just like you would in any personal endeavor, even more so. We have to set some goals, have a focus as a church. So what is it that we strive for? You know, it's clear when we look at churches like Corinth that you can have great talents and develop those talents and show them off. And still, it's, it's not translating into success before Christ. We're going to see next week, the church at Laodicea, how they were uh, financially it seems, doing very well. They felt very rich, and yet they're struggling in the eyes of the Lord. Sardis had a great name among men, but Christ declares that they are spiritually dead. But there are two churches in this list of seven that Christ writes epistles to there in Asia, and they're good examples for us. They don't seem so on the surface. You've got Smyrna that we've looked at already. They're described as impoverished. They're a poor church. And Philadelphia that we're going to talk about today is small in strength. But those deficiencies didn't hinder their ministry. In fact, it magnified their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It revealed His power at work through them. And this is a great encouragement to us, whether you're a small church comparatively uh, to many of the large congregations among the world and other religious denominations, I know Carmichael can seem small as far as our number, as far as our influence, and yet it's not about who we are. It's about the one we serve and the one who holds us. And that's the lesson here from the epistle of uh, to Philadelphia. What a wonderful lesson this is. Real quickly, some background. Philadelphia was located in the Hermas Valley, uh, 30 miles south of Sardis. We're kind of following uh, the highway that cuts this way. This city, uh, we kind of know it from the Philadelphia here in the United States, uh, meaning brotherly love. And there's a history behind that. Uh, this city was founded by Attalus, who was faithful in support of his brother, King Eumenes of Pergamum. And so it was kind of named after that, that spirit that he had. Uh, uh, the brother lover was kind of his nickname. Philadelphia was one of the first Hellenistic cities in this portion of Asia Minor. In what was the kingdom of Lydia, uh, it was very influential in bringing Greek uh, philosophy, and particularly Greek religion to that whole region. Uh, because the city was famous for its wine and its vineyards, they particularly worshipped the, the god of wine, Dionysus. Earthquakes were a problem in this area. It was on a fault line, and uh, after it was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 17, the emperor Caesar Tiberius helped rebuild it, and they built a great monument in his honor and so like we've seen in some of the other cities emperor worship became a major part of the focus here in philadelphia and all of these things made things tough because again christians are standing apart from that idolatry we're standing apart from the world and what a challenge that was for little philadelphia but again there is a, a another opposition that these this church faces this came from displaced jews that were in the region, and they carried on that hatred that we see in the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day. They despised the Christians and sought to slander them to their enemies. Here's this little church. 
surrounded by this dark world, surrounded by spiritual and physical foes, and it would seem there's no hope for them. But consider the one that's writing to them. Let's talk first of all about the Christ. Revelation 3, 7, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. First thing that we see revealed about our Lord Jesus here in these verses is his holiness. For us, holiness is a work in progress. It's something we're striving for as the Holy Spirit works in us. But there's always that battle. Well, with Christ, holiness is his perfect shining glory. Holiness reveals how set apart he is from all that is evil. How perfect he is in every way. You know, his miracles were awesome when we look at his his ministry, how he healed thousands, how he cast out demons, how he raised the dead, but his perfect life. The fact that he could go day by day, trial after trial, through the wilderness where Satan afflicted him, facing those enemies to the very cross, and yet he always did that which pleased the Father. There was no sin in him, not outwardly, not inwardly. That, perhaps, is the most glorious revelation of his person of all that he is truly the Son of God, that he is victorious over all sin. As the Father is holy, so is the Son. Now, he that is holy is writing to uphold this little church as they're striving to be holy themselves. They're striving for holiness in this spiritual battle in Philadelphia. Holiness. But then truth. You know, truth can have a couple meanings in this text Uh, but both of them can really be applied to the Lord Jesus. First, he's true in the sense that he is real. You know, among the Roman pantheon, they had all these gods, and and I mentioned this in previous messages, that if you had a god and you wanted to worship the god, would just add him to the pantheon, add him to to the list, and that's okay. That didn't work for Christianity. That doesn't work for the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one God And he's in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But there is no other. And Jesus is saying he's not competing with Zeus or Dionysus or some emperor among men. He is God. He's true. Secondly, the term can speak of his faithfulness to his promises. He's one that never speaks apart from action. He never just says something. He does it. He never changes course. He never fails to accomplish his purpose. So you can trust him. You can trust his word. All that he's promised. He is true. But then thirdly, we see his power. We read there in the text, he hath the key of David. He opens and no man shuts. He shuts and no man opens. A a key speaks of authority. To hold the key uh, of something, it means that that is in your control. Revelation 1.18, I don't have it on the screen, but that tells us that Jesus holds the key to hell and death. That he judges the wicked. That he brings men into destruction at his purpose. But here, he holds the key of David, and that speaks of the kingdom of the Messiah. He opens a door for ministry. He purposes to save his people through a ministry of a church and add to the church. No one can shut that door. Though every king, every demon is putting their full weight trying to slam that door shut, trying to hold it back from being open. They can't do it. When Christ opens the door, the door is opened. Revelation 3.8, he tells this church, I know thy works. Behold, I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. If Christ is at the heart of a ministry, If he's holding open that door of outreach and service, well, you can be absolutely confident in him. You know, so often these these, uh, descriptions of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are fearful when we look at some of the descriptions to to the other churches. He that has the eyes like a flame of fire. But here... What an encouragement to Philadelphia. What an encouragement to faithful believers just to consider the one who's truly behind our ministry. We see the Christ. Let's talk about the church. 
Revelation 3, 8, For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. So first of all, this is a church of little strength. And uh, that sounds kind of insulting. Who wants to be called little? You get the idea of somebody that's wimpy, somebody that's helpless. Little means failure. Little means no hope of success. That, that's how we think. But that's not what Christ is saying here in this text. You see, he delights to do great things through small instruments. In fact, we see this several times in Scripture. Just to give you a couple, Jesus says in Matthew 13, 31, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among the herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, here's what uh, God said to Paul. By the way, the name Paul means little. Once Saul of Tarsus rejoiced in his own greatness and his own strength, now he becomes Paul. He takes that name Paul. He's small, and he's got some kind of weakness, and he prays that the Lord would take away that weakness. He feels like this is hindering his ministry, and the Lord says, No, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And the apostle responds, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. How much better to have little strength but to be in the hand of the Almighty God than to have all the power of the kings of this world. Oh, I'd rather be of little strength. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. And that was the understanding of Philadelphia. They had little strength, but they had great labor. They couldn't preach like Apollos. They couldn't work great miracles that we know of. They didn't have a lot of money or very many members, it might seem. But what they had, they used to the fullest. And we need to kind of have this mindset uh, as individuals and as churches because so often we want to get upset with God because uh, of what we are. Why didn't he give me greater talents? Why doesn't he allow us uh, to have greater uh, opportunities and, and more funds and all these things we would, we would like to have, and then we could surely be successful. God's given us what we need, not just in this world, but the spirit that dwells within us. And so the key is, what am I doing with what God has given? You know, Jesus, he's there at the temple, and he looks over, and he sees this widow casting in her last mites. He rejoiced over that more than all those who cast in of their abundance. She gave all that she had. She held nothing back. This is what Christ desires. He loves little churches like Philadelphia. They just serve with all their might. They, they, they give all they have from the depths of their heart. That's our goal. So there was great labor, and kind of going along with that is great faith. Thou hast not denied my name, not in word, not in action. As you know, you consider the idol worshiping world around them. You consider the opposition that they face from uh, the, the Jewish community and their persecutors. That is saying quite a bit. You know, this is a theme we see again and again throughout the scriptures. You've got uh, Abraham taking on multiple kings with just a few servants. You've got Israel trapped by Egypt at the Red Sea. You've got Gideon with 300 facing Midianites who filled the whole valley like grasshoppers. You've got Hezekiah and Israel surrounded by mighty Assyria. God's people are smaller than their foes. The odds are stacked against us from this world, but faith looks out and sees what, kind of, what Elisha saw there at Dothan. He saw the chariots of fire surrounding you see, our, by our faith, we see God. We see he that is with us is more than they which be against us. In fact, here's another verse for you that the Lord told his disciples, and this is a message to each of us. Mark eleven twenty two. have faith in God. Verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, I don't know that the disciples ever went and cast physical mountains or anybody has ever cast a physical mountain into the ocean, 
But I think instead of just having our minds fixed on a massive rock, think about the barriers to your ministry. Think of your own weakness and frailty in a world that hates your message, and you look at those barriers and you say, I can't move that. I can't accomplish that. Well, you don't. Christ does. He goes before us. He works through us. And Philadelphia saw that. They went out and they just held fast to Christ's name and they're preaching his name, suffering for his name, standing for truth. And mountains were moved before this little church because the Lord was at work. Revelation 3.10. He goes on to tell them, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, a clear interpretation of the first part of that verse would be that you have kept my command to endure patiently. They had great patience. You know, the fact that they had little strength probably means that they saw very little result from their labor. We don't see Philadelphia getting bigger. And you know, the way we think is, you know, you serve for a little bit and then you look for some result. Lord, I've been faithful. What are you going to do about it? Surely we're going to grow as a church. Surely I'm going to see this sacrifice pay off. Surely I'm going to at least see that this is accomplishing something. Philadelphia, from the standpoint of the world, they stayed little. They didn't see those physical results. But they didn't stop. They knew Christ had given them a command. Go preach the gospel. They knew Christ had given them promises. Lo, I'm with you always. And so they went on. And they kept on. Would we be impressed by Philadelphia? Most of us looking at them, probably not. We might wonder, how does that even that little church even stay together? Not much of a church at all. But to Christ, this is a jewel in his crown. This is a, a group of believers full of labor, of faith, of patience. And while he has something to criticize or to have to rebuke in so many of these other churches, here he sees little Philadelphia and he, they're precious to him. How awesome that is. And then there's a promise that Christ gives to this church. And let's focus on that. First of all, there's a promise of victory. Revelation 3, 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Now, we can certainly imagine these these. Jews, they were very prideful. They were very derisive of this little church and their gospel. They, their hearts were hard as stone. To try to go and preach to one of those, not only do you have no hope of success, you're probably endangering your life. But Christ gives them this promise. He says, I'm going to bring them to your feet in worship. That could talk, uh, be speaking about a lat- the latter days, uh, the, a time of judgment when opposition to Christ is overcome and those who once persecuted and mocked Christians are brought down. I like to look at this, though, and I see an even greater victory. That is that when those who once hated the church and and hated the gospel join with them in their worship. Matthew 16, verse 18, we read this grand statement of the Lord Jesus. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Think about that. That's not just a defensive statement. It's not just saying that my church will survive. It's an offensive statement. It's saying that as my church goes forward, my little churches even, showing my love, preaching my truth, the Spirit is going to work in the hearts and work through that gospel in those that have once stood against Him. And so those that were once enemies, become their brethren, become a part of them. It's like the Lord disarms Satan and uses his own weapon against him. You don't believe that's possible. Well, the Apostle Paul would assure you it is. When you feel like evil is winning, when you feel like things are hopeless and you're so small against such evil, consider the true victory Christ is accomplishing. What he's already done in you what he's done in the church, and what he can do in the lives of those you minister to. There's a victory here that we can be sure of. But then there's a Savior. 
Look again at verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, in the immediate sense, this assures the church the Lord's going to protect them from the attacks of Satan. They've got to strive to keep the faith. They have to strive from their standpoint to resist temptation. But none, man or devil, is going to take them from the arms of the Good Shepherd. Now, there are a lot of individuals that will take this, a lot of commentaries, uh, a lot of Bible scholars will take this passage and apply it to the great tribulation that's going to precede the coming of the Lord Jesus. And they're going to argue that when this time of great judgment and calamity comes upon the earth, that the church is not going to face that horror, that they're going to be raptured or brought out and delivered from it. You know, I'm not completely certain. I hope that's true. I, I would certainly want that. But, you know, regardless, the, this promise holds true and we can apply it whether it's today or whether it's tomorrow. The Lord keeps us. The Lord holds us. The Lord's not going to let us go. And if Christ is our focus, He's our hope, we can have peace no matter what we face, even if we're in the midst of the greatest tribulation. There's a Savior. And then there's a crown. Here's a challenge in verse 11, but it's also part of a promise. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that that Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And this, I think, harkens back to what James 1.12 is saying. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he's tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. It's not a piece of gold or jewels to wear around on our heads. Maybe there is a physical crown that we're going to be handed in glory or maybe some type of reward. But that's not the picture here. This crown is symbolic for our eternal life. For the moment the race is over and we shine out with the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. Can you lose that crown? Well, no man can lose his salvation. We know that's true. But... The challenge is for believers, we've got to keep running our race because we're not done with it. Even though we know Christ is keeping us and it's His power we trust and His promises, we've got to hold fast to Him. We've got to keep the faith. We cannot let a trial or temptation or false doctrine draw us away from Him. Keep on. Don't give up. You're little. The race is hard. You look around and you see those standing up against you and you say, how am I going to overcome it? Just keep running. Just keep serving and know that at the end of that race, you're not going to look back with regret. You're not going to look back and see failure. You're going to look back and rejoice as you receive that crown of life to cast at my feet. That's that's a beautiful promise for churches to take to heart. Finally, there's a name. Revelation 3.12, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Speaking of a, a permanence of our place with Him. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You know, when you get married, uh, some of you ladies would take your husband's last name. I guess there's some individuals, they'll hyphenate both their last names, but you but you take the name of that one you love. And that's something special. It says that we're united as one. It says that we are a family. And so here, we're clearly marked as God's child, as His people. We're a citizen of heaven. We're a part of the bride of Christ. You are mine. I am yours forever. How precious is that name? How sad if ever we're ashamed right now to be called Christians. You know, that's a precious thing. I want to be Christ-like. I want His name. But how precious that in His sight, He puts His name upon me. Think about it, brethren. Which one of these churches would you want to be like? Which one of these churches would you imitate? You know, we might be tempted to envy Ephesus or Laodicea, these larger congregations that seem to have more influence. And we say, who wants to be like little Philadelphia? What could they do? 
Maybe you relate to Philadelphia. Maybe you are a part of a small church and you see those little results and you just say, you know what, I'm not, I'm not much. I'm not doing much. I'm making so little impact in this world. But look through the eyes of the Lord. And you realize it's not numbers. It's not the size of buildings or budgets or even the talents of the individual in the church. It's the heart. It is that Christ is glorified in us as we give our all to him, trusting him, loving him, serving him. Oh, to have the testimony of Philadelphia to take this little string, but to submit it all to Christ and see him do great things through us. I pray that that's an, an encouragement to you and that you can look at Philadelphia and say, that's a goal for me and for my church. Looking forward as we can finish up our study with Laodicea in the next message. Until that time, may the Lord bless you.